For our guest, I'm Bill Hudson, uh, one of the deacons here, and we'd like to welcome y'all to church. Uh, so just got a couple of announcements we want to do. Uh, connect cards, if you're a guest, we appreciate it if you'd fill out a connect card. That's just an opportunity, or if you have a prayer request, you can turn it in, and it'll go in our boxes out back. And uh, just, a, just an opportunity for us to learn about who's coming into church. Uh, I want to remind everybody today at 5 o'clock, about our 5 o'clock, we're going to have our, our dinner. So bring a, bring a friend, bring a meal, and, and come on and enjoy. The guy that's going to help me fry turkey will be here at 2 o'clock. Women's Bible study. So we're going to have it at Annette's house. Where's Annette? Annette's this week. On November 21st at 6 p.m., she said, bring a snack. Gingerbread House Contest. Heather asked me to remind everybody that if you're going to participate in the contest, you need to turn in your money next week for the uh, Gingerbread House. And Staff Love Offering. Right now for the next three weeks, we've taken up Staff Love Offering to give an opportunity for us to show our staff how much we appreciate them. So, uh, that leads me into giving. So we have several ways you can give. Of course, you know, you got the clear boxes out front. You can drop in your uh, offering. Uh, you can text it. Look in the bulletin for the number to text to, or you can give it online. Or drop it by the office. So, I think that's everything to talk about. So, once again, glad y'all came. Appreciate it. Well, good morning. Will you please stand and join us as we begin to worship?
song. I'm going to have a helper. Um, you know, as a parent, you just love to hear your kids worship. And this is one of their, my kids' favorite songs. So I just asked Sophie to help us today. Yeah. 
God, I just thank you so much for just giving us the opportunity to come together and worship you, God. God, I pray that before anybody stepped into this building, that they got their hearts right with you. And if they did it, God, I pray that you would just speak to us right now and just, or just whatever's going on in our life, that we can just push that aside for just a little bit so we can just worship you. So we can pitch our tent, as I've heard this week, pitch our tent and wait on you to speak. God, this next song that we're singing is Believe For It. And it just says that because you said it, we believe it. God, I pray that that is true for each and every one of us. God, I pray that you would just lead us in the most beautiful worship right now. In your name I pray. You guys can be seated.
thank you so much. At this time, I need all my kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, if you'll come on down with me. Good morning. God is good all the time. And he is so good. This is a week where we remember his goodness, this Thanksgiving week and the Thanksgiving meals. Uh, if you're like my house, we're going to have a full house of people coming to remember just how good God has been to our country and to us as a people. And this morning, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Now, it, as we say as often as we do it, and it's been a while since we've taken the Lord's Supper together here at Temple, and for those of you watching online, that's what we'll be doing. So the message today is going to be focused on what does it mean to come to the Lord's table. And just thinking about Thanksgiving, in a very real sense, the, the Lord's Supper, what Jesus gave us in His body and His blood, that's really the ultimate Thanksgiving meal, isn't it? You know, for those outside the Christian faith, when they hear us talk about taking the blood of Christ and eating the body of Christ, that sounds rather strange, doesn't it? And when you're the, the age of those that just went out hearing this, are, are we really eating the body and the blood? Well, this is going to be a memorial. And as we move through what Scripture teaches us about the Lord's Supper today, it, it's all about the forgiveness of sins. Everything we've been studying in Ephesians, right, about uh, seeing the world right side up through God's lens. This, this is really a continuation of that, but we're going to be going into the different passages of Scripture that speak on the Lord's Supper. I'm beginning this morning with Matthew 26, Matthew 26, verses 14 through 30. You can turn there in your Bibles or, or go there on your, your phones or tablet. This is the account in Matthew. Now, the account of the Lord's Supper is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's alluded to in John, and John we see the things he actually said in the upper room. We won't go into all of those today, but I chose to read this account from Matthew so that we, we, we start on the same page as we examine what does it mean to come to God's Thanksgiving table. Then uh, one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they weighed out 30 pieces of silver for him. And from that time, he started looking for a good opportunity to, to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man, he said, and tell him, The teacher says, My time is near. I am celebrating the Passover at your place with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. And when evening came, he was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. He replied, The one who has dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Judas, his betrayer, replied, Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told him. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we ask your Holy Spirit just to illuminate these words in our hearts and our minds. Father, as we hear these words that you had Matthew pen about the night Jesus was to be betrayed, about those who would betray him, Father, even more gloriously about the fact that he would have his body broken so that we could be healed from the sins and hurts inflicted upon us by the world, and even more so and more important, Father, as we contemplate the blood of Jesus shed on a cross for the forgiveness of sins, my sins, your sins, the sins of the world, so that all who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Father, we give you thanks for that. 
precious blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. The hurts and wrongs we have committed against others, Father. Lord, as we come together as a family of believers, Lord, uh, we are going to take this supper to remember what Jesus has done for us and will do for us. Again, Father, let your Holy Spirit open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. And may your Spirit empower us to become more like Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, the setting, the day of the Passover was coming. And if you think back, this Lord's Supper it has its beginnings all the way back in Exodus when Moses was leading the people with God's direction and God's power out of 400 years of slavery. And they sacrificed a Passover lamb so that the angel of death would pass over the people that had blood on their posts. This is what Jesus was going to be celebrating. And in that heart, this is always about the freedom of God's people. What God gave them back in Exodus and what occurs right here in this passage and what we'll be celebrating together has always declared God's intention to redeem and save all of his children from sin, from death, so that we'd be with God forever. I can only imagine how it felt at that day and time for Jesus, knowing that Judas was going to betray him, knowing that he was going to be on the cross, knowing that this meal was going to be his last meal, a real meal of significance with those that had been with him for three years. And if you notice, this passage began with 30 pieces of silver. And every time I come to this table and every time I think about the Lord's Supper, uh, that sense of betrayal and that sense of new life being side by side it always just grips me. I hope it grips you. Because when we come to the Lord's table, we do have business to do with the Lord. That is the human condition, isn't it? As we've gone through Ephesians, we are doubly dead in our sins. We're dead to God and our brokenness is in sin, dead to each other. Because it wasn't only Jesus that was going to be in a room with that person that betrayed him. All the others were there. And they wondered, will it be me that betray him? Always a question that we need to have. Will we betray Christ? Will we betray his body that was broken for our healing, his blood that was poured out for sin? How will we continue to live this life with, with Christ and with each other? Because in his death and burial and resurrection, we are reconciled to God and we are also reconciled with one another. We're always told when we come to this table, don't come with something broken between you and God, and don't come if something's broken between you and someone else that you have the power to do something about. We'll see that as we move in it. Really important to remember when it comes to sin and death and life and forgiveness, it's all on God's terms. You know, you're going to have a Thanksgiving meal this week, and Perhaps you're the host, and when you're the host, you get to determine the time and the, and the place and the food and the drink, don't you? You know, every time I get an invitation to go somewhere else, I have to admit a little bit selfishly, I'm starting to think, well, they're not going to let me make my oyster dressing because there's a lot of people that just don't like oysters in their dressing. I've got some dear friends that have been, Alan Lim, known them since I was, I don't know, that high. And they don't really like oyster dressing, and if I was going to their house, we wouldn't be having it. But since they're at my house, guess what? I get to determine what we're having. People said, what can I bring? I got to tell them. But you know what about God? How much more so for him because he's the creator of the universe. He created you. He created me. He created everything in it. We're the ones who broke things. Humanity. We broke our relationship with him and we broke our relationships with each other. Look at the pain and sin and misery Humanity inflicts upon one another if you, if you doubt that statement at all. Another mass shooting just overnight. It seems like every day, right? Where does the evil in the world come from? Humanity. Where does the good in the world come from? Jesus Christ, his broken body, his poured out blood. 
because God created us all, it only makes sense that he's the one who determines the time and place and how we are redeemed and what it takes for our forgiveness. The Bible teaches the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. What we'll celebrate in the Lord's Supper is that he died in our place. God got to choose that it would be his son that would be our food and his blood that would be our drink. Oh, a year or so ago, I fell in a cistern. I was walking across the yard, and the, the house we were renting was over 125 years old, and suddenly my right leg disappeared and was dangling, and this one, my left one folded up underneath me, and it hurt. I got my leg out of that hole as fast as I could. because I, I was thinking snakes and gators, because this was down by Fort Bayou. I got up and moved around. This, this left leg just hurt. And I, I, I was a man, so did I go to the doctor? No. About three weeks later, it still hurt, and I go and they x-ray it. And my bone had been broken. But he looked at me and said, well, but you waited long enough now that it's, it's already healing. There's nothing else I can do. Just let it finish healing. It's, it's straight. Think about how God heals a broken bone like that. Nobody else intervened. Nobody else did anything. I, I surely didn't heal myself. I was stubborn. I didn't even go to the doctor. You see, how much more so in what Jesus does in allowing his body to be broken for us, right? And providing himself for our food. <laughs> you know, in Isaiah, he said, by his stripes we will be healed. And it, it is God that, it is Jesus Christ that heals us and repairs us from all of the Hurts inflicted upon us. I certainly didn't want to fall in a hole and break my leg. God, he just designed us to be healed. And he, see, he designed us to be healed from the brokenness in our relationships through his son, Jesus Christ. There is no other way. It's his design. So God sets the time and place of this meal. I have a habit, my, my wife and I, if we run into somebody that doesn't have a place to go at Thanksgiving, we say, come over to our house. And before we get turned around, we're having to go and find tables. Because you know in the community around us, there's people that don't have any place to go on Thanksgiving. There's widows and widowers living and scattered around out here that their kids weren't going to come from Atlanta or Dallas or wherever they live to see them, and they're going to be home alone. Jesus tells a story of a banquet. And the king invited everybody to the banquet. Did you know there was a lot of people that said they were too busy to go and take care of the king's and attend the king's son's wedding? Can you imagine that? Luke 22, verses 15 to 16. Jesus said he's fervently desired to eat this banquet with his disciples. And see, when we look at who's invited to this table, everybody's invited to the table of the Lord. He earnestly, Jesus earnestly desires us to come to this table. This table the wedding banquet, those that were too busy. He then told his servants, go out and invite the poor and the lame and the hungry and the hurting to come to this banquet. And see, that is the invitation Jesus delivered. John 3.16 says, for whosoever believes in his name. You see, the invitation to God's table is for everyone, everyone here, everyone listening, all the world. To come to the banquet. All are invited. But here's the truth. While everybody's invited, not everybody's going to partake of what Jesus Christ offers. That's 
really heartbreaking when you think about it, isn't it? Again, Jesus' story about coming to the wedding banquet, a great occasion, something to celebrate, and people were too busy to come to the table. When we talk about Christ's invitation to receive forgiveness and healing, it seems insanity that anybody would reject that, doesn't it? Why reject forgiveness and healing? Well, as we move through Ephesians, there's pride. That's one of the reasons. Why didn't I go to the doctor and get my leg looked after? I hate to have to admit when I was dumb, but that was just dumb, wasn't it? Why do people reject Christ? Because they want to be in control. They want to be like God. Is that you today? Knowing you have an invitation to Christ's table to be forgiven and to be healed? There's another really base reason why we reject it, and it's right here in Judas. Because we'll see that not only do some just not show up, some actually come to the table with a wrong spirit, the spirit of greed, the spirit of betrayal. Again, reading that passage, it it never escapes me where he says Judas is going to betray me. 30 pieces of silver, good old-fashioned greed, the knife in the back. It says so much about our Christ, our Jesus, doesn't it? He sat down and broke bread with that man, fully knowing what he was doing. Judas was going to betray him. And so here, side by side with the the heart of Christ, the love of Jesus saying, I'm going to pour out my blood for you. I'm going to have my body broken for you. Is this human spirit of betrayal and greed and at the heart of us all that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? If you're interested, there's a, a detail. He says, the one who dips his bread in the wine with me is going to betray me. In the practice of the Passover, in the practice of that meal, guess how many people in that room would dip their bread in that, in that wine? They all did. Now, Judas's betrayal was up front and bold. He had, uh, can you imagine that silver rattling in his pocket? And we know from Scripture that, that Judas was a thief. He would steal from the poor box. They, 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 had, they would gather offering Jesus and his ministry to help feed the poor as they, they came and ministered to them. If you remember in, in the book of John, right before this upper room event, Jesus was anointed with expensive perfume, and Judas and his self-righteousness piped up and said, Hey, we, we, you're wasting money. We, we could use that money to feed the poor. And you know what Scripture says about him explicitly? He sa- it says he said this, Because he would steal from the box. From time immemorial, there have been thieves in the Lord's house. Wolves in sheep's clothing. People who want to make money off of God. That's a harsh and stern warning. But see, at at the heart of this is this idea of greed. And as we've learned in Ephesians, as we've been traveling through that, what is the heart of impurity? The desire to consume somebody for your own gratification, whether that is sexually, materially, taking from others for yourself. God calls us to be like Christ. And Christ did what? Gave himself up for us and sacrificed himself for us. The stakes, so to speak, of coming to the Lord's table with the right attitude are incredibly serious. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth because it had troubles. There were bad and broken relationships inside that church. And at any given time, you you take a snapshot in time of a church life, there's going to be some problems between people. And I 
I don't know if any of you have problems with each other here in this room or outside. This church had troubles, and here's what Paul had to say to them about when they would come together for this Lord's meal and even for the kind of meal we're going to have this evening. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. Now, in giving this instruction, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. Indeed, it is necessary that there be factions among you. That there be uh, factions among you, so that you, those who are approved may be recognized among you. When you come together, then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper, so one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat? His own supper? <clears throat> or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you in this manner. They were greedy. What was going on? Can you imagine if we had to bring our own wine and bread to share? And some of the people that had a lot of money brought a whole lot and wouldn't share with anybody else. This is what was going on there. This brokenness. And, and this was about the Lord's Supper. Then in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. He speaks more about this. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you previously walked according to the way of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the evil, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ. Even though we are dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. This hard, stark contrast. Greed. Sin. Consumption. Versus giving. Providing. Rich in what? Mercy and grace. When we come to the Lord's table, we're reminded of these two extremes always. And that's heart of betrayal, the heart of coming to the table with the wrong motives and motions. It's having a deep time of self-examination. Asking the Holy Spirit to show you what spirit do you come to this table in. We read on, and I know I'm bringing us back and forth a bit. First, back in 1 Corinthians, verse 23 again. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night he was being betrayed, Jesus took this bread. Then we go down to verse 28. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him not eat and drink the bread from the cup, bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. Coming to the table, examining yourself. Notice he says point blank here. To examine yourself so that God doesn't have to examine you. Think back when you were in school. Did you prefer a closed book test or an open book test? Pretty, pretty silly question. Who, who doesn't want an open book test? If you have an open book test, you'll get the answers right. And in this, in this passage in Corinthians, Paul will say, as often as we do the Lord's Supper... One of the reasons we have the Lord's Supper and the symbolism of his body and his blood, and we use, always repeat the words of Jesus, this is my body broken for you, and this is my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, the blood of a new covenant, a new promise from God, is that that's our open book test. 
he gives us the symbols to, to remind us what, what is true about the broken blood. I mean, the broken body. Yes, he knows we go through life hurting. You might be hurting this morning. Harmed from the sin in the world and the sin and brokenness of people. God has made you a promise, a new covenant that he will heal you. He heals you with his presence. You may still have the limp. My broken left leg still hurts because my knee got wrenched. I'll remember falling in that hole probably till the day I die. You've had some hurts and things inflicted upon you in life, right? Do you believe God can heal you? That God's presence with you? When you come to the table, you're, you're saying, yes, I believe. I've done some wrong things in my life. Well, there's many things when it comes to my relationships with my kids and other people that I've said and done hurtful things. How about you? You know what the, the Bible word is for doing hurtful things to somebody else? Sin. <laughs> There's only one solution for sin. That is the blood of Jesus Christ. When we come to this table, do we remember that it's the blood of Christ that forgives us? See, Jesus broke this bread and said, it's my body. And then he said, do this. Do this. Take this bread. Eat it. He took the cup and he said, this is my blood. Do this. Take it. Drink it. And, and in perpetuity, we, we come to the Lord's table because it's the open book test saying, we must remember these things. And here's the serious questions you need to ask yourself in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're gathered here two or three in his name, so it's in the presence of Jesus. Jesus said when two or three are gathered in his name, there he is where? In our midst. This is a holy thing that we do coming to the table. It's a holy thing we do when we come together. And holy means it's set apart for God. Ask him to look into your heart. First, just, just a handful of questions I have here for you to think about as we prepare to come to the table. And just so you know how we're going to do this today, we'll, we'll come and we'll, we'll bless the, the, the bread and the blood and, and we'll have an invitation. And under the invitation, you, you will come forward and, and take your, uh, the body and blood, take the uh, little cup, they're all together, and go back and finish praying. And when you're ready, you can take and eat and take and drink. But we want to do business with the Lord together this morning. And this begins with this self-exam time because, again, if we don't examine ourselves, then God is going to examine us and give us judgment. The first question, have you trusted Christ's death for your salvation from sin? Have you trusted in Christ's death for your salvation from sin? Is that real to you? Anybody here sin this week? Wrong attitudes, wrong thoughts, wrong actions, right? Do you know what makes us right before God? It is this blood of Christ. Do we truly trust him? And do we think about his blood, the fact, that bloody cross, everything that took place there, See, sin should grieve us, right? Sin causes death, and it caused the death of Jesus. Do we trust him from our, for our salvation from our sin? The second question is related. Are you continuing to fight sin in the power of the Spirit? It's funny how the world can make us weary, isn't it? It most makes us weary, and there's another word with the same W-E-A-R. It, it, it makes us weary, and it wears us down. And you know what happens when we're out in a, in a community and a world full of sin? It can wear us down to where we start to think that it's not too serious to God. We'll just go along to what? Get along. We start acting 
like everybody else. And don't think the adjectives about acting, smoking, drink, all the, think about the heart of it. What's really wrong out there is people prey upon one another and try to consume one another to, to make themselves feel good where the only thing that brings us life is Jesus Christ. So when we talk about continuing to fight sin, are we fighting against that, uh, that depth of, what about me? I want what I want. Shouldn't they give, give me something? And that can even be projected, God, God owes me something. When we truly understand it's through the death of Christ that we're saved from our sin, we understand that the only thing God owes us is what? Death. But he chooses to give us life through his son, Jesus Christ. And so this second question, are you fighting sin and the power of the Spirit? You see, you're asking the Holy Spirit to keep that fresh in you. Left on your own and alone, separated from other believers that believe hey, this, first, this first one that Christ has saves us from our sin. Left on your own, you can't fight sin by your own power. You'll never stop sinning on your own. You ever known anybody or, or you've been somebody that's been trapped in addiction, which by the way, all of us have because we're sinners. Sinners is another word for addiction, addicted to self. Okay? You can't fight addiction on your own, can you? So it's saying this question, asking before you come to the table, are you relying on the Holy Spirit to power your life? and to keep you right before God. Third question. Are you continuing to draw grace from Christ who lives forever to intercede for us? Any of you talk to yourselves in your head? Come on, be honest. Everybody in here should raise their hand, right? You have thoughts run through your head. This running dialogue. Sometimes the dialogue in my head is not very healthy. How about yours? You know, I can start thinking poorly about myself. I can start thinking poorly about others. This dialogue. Do you know what will break that bad dialogue in your head is, is understanding and believing this. Getting grace from Jesus, who's alive. He, not only did he die and shed his blood and was buried, but he was raised from the dead on the third day, right? And Scripture says he's there before God, interceding for us night and day, saying, Hey, Vince, your servant, you love him and he loves you. Let's intercede for him. Let's, let's, let's show him this new life. Let's give him this abundant life. And he's saying about that about each one of you. And so when we come and take of the Lord's table, the body of blood, we're, we're reminded of that. That he's interceding for us. Somebody is, is, is having a running dialogue with God. How much more important is that dialogue between Jesus and God about us than the one in our head? And so I'll start trying to think, okay, what would Jesus be saying to God on my behalf right now? What do I need to hear him say about the person that I'm interacting with that just might be getting on my last nerve at that moment? And suddenly I see that person as somebody God loves and who Jesus is also interceding for. Because see, the truth of this, he's not just interceding for me. He's interceding for who? Us. What a change in perception. This is what it means to draw grace. We need more grace. So every time we come to this table, we're reminded that God gave us grace in Jesus Christ. An ultimate grace and a continuing forever grace. This fourth one. Have you begun to grow cold in your love and become self-indulgent in your life? I got a little typo there. Have you become cold in your love, love for God, love for other people. You, you know, one of the ways you know if your love is growing cold is if you have the phrase, those people in your vocabulary. Anybody have that phrase show up 
when you're thinking about another group of people? For those people. Who did God invite to this table? Everyone. What did it say? Don't worry. All are invited to Christ's table. Well, if everyone's invited, who would those people be that aren't invited? No one. Have you begun to grow cold? This, this is part of examining yourself so you don't come here in an unworthy manner. Cold in your love. And then the second thing, have you become self-indulgent in your life? I'm about to turn 57 here in January. And I have had these thoughts. Well, I think I'm old enough people should just do it my way without saying they want to do it differently every time I suggest us doing something. You ever feel that way? You don't have to be 57. You can be 16, right? To feel that way. Self-indulgent. Oh, the Finding Nemo, do you remember those seagulls? They'd go, mine, 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 mine. Self-indulgent is thinking about yourself and how it impacts you. That big wedding banquet that Jesus told them about that God would the king was throwing and he invited the noble people, the good people, the people that would be in church like us today. One was too busy, had a field he had to go tend to. Another had a party that was going to be more fun. He wanted to go there. That's self-indulgent, isn't it? God called you to a banquet table. God calls you to his Thanksgiving table. Are you self-indulgent? Jesus said both, Jesus says in this account in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke that he wasn't going to take this again until he comes back. That's something else this table does. It, it keeps us looking ahead for Christ's return. We look back at what he's done and, and we, in the present and what he's doing and, and, and his ongoing healing and forgiving and making us more like Christ. And then we look to the future for when he comes back. And everything is made right. This is your self-exam time. How's your love of Christ? How's your spirit-filled living? Is your love hot or is it cold? You got a little blank there. As you think about that, give yourself a grade. Then if you're real brave, ask the person sitting next to you, is this about right? Because <laughs> they'll know, won't they? They'll know what your grade is on these, on these things. It's an open book test, so if you're honest with God and you can confess your sins to Him, He is righteous and just and He will forgive you. There was a warning here in Corinthians. Verse 29, for whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you and many have fallen asleep. Look at verse 31. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Those are pretty hard words, aren't they? Examine yourself, judge yourself. Paul says that again in 2 Corinthians to this same church. Examine yourself, take a hard look, otherwise you're going to be suffering God's judgment. Wait a minute, pastor, God's love. What's this judgment on sin stuff? That's reality. God disciplines those he loves. You see, in our upside-down world, we've made disciplined bad and we made judgment what bad as followers of christ who believe in this broken body and his blood poured out judgment for us is what good judgment seeing the world the way it is seeing ourselves the way we are 
Discipline, when we are wrong, discipline's good. Discipline corrects what's wrong and makes it right. God's going to give us and the whole world a final exam. And here's going to be the, the verdict. You see, it's not on a letter scale when it comes to the end of time when Christ returns. That is when judgment on the whole world is rendered. The Bible tells us the world's condemned already for its sin. That's why Jesus came and died, was buried, and he was raised again on the third day so that we can believe and know that we will have life. And when this judgment comes, we will have the phrase forgiven, redeemed. The name of Jesus Christ stamped on our foreheads and our hearts. We're called. For those of us who believe God's test grade is going to have grace and peace and faith for us, right? That's what we'll celebrate as we come. When you eat that bread in a minute and you drink that juice in a minute, it means that God has given you a passing grade if you believe in Christ. If you don't come here with a spirit of betrayal saying oh, you're just going through the motions and you come here because your wife or your husband or your family, but you don't really believe, don't come to this table. Don't take it. Even if you've been got wet, I'll use that word instead of baptism. If you don't believe today, don't come to that table until you have professed your faith in Christ with sincerity of heart that you believe he is God's son who came and had his body broken for our healing and his blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. Grace and peace and faith is what he calls us to at this table. Oh, God's Thanksgiving table. Is there anything you'd be more thankful for than your forgiveness of your sins and being guaranteed a place in eternity to live with God forever and ever. Oh, not only did God in set this table, God came and said he'll come in with us. I want to finish with this verse, Revelation 3.20, Acts 19 and 20. It says this, As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline so be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Jesus came here to us. I talked about that Thanksgiving meal. If I'm the host, I can set the time and the place. This image about eating with Jesus, he comes and he knocks on the door of your life. And he says, say yes to me. Let me come in. I'll eat with you. You'll eat with me. You'll be healed. You'll be forgiven. And he issues that invitation to all. He stands at every door and knocks have you opened that door in your life today we're going to take some time as musicians hopefully make their way back shortly we're trying to time some things here spend some time in silent prayer with Christ with Jesus with his Holy Spirit would you put those five questions back up there Think through those. Pray through those. Ask God to just look into your heart. We'll be preparing this table to bless the food, the, the bread and the blood. And after you're, they've played for a while and you've prayed for a while, as, as, as you finish doing business with the Lord, just come on up to the table and, and come and take. We'll be here to pray with you too. If you need to wait and not take it, nobody's going to judge you. In fact, God won't judge you if you're judging yourself. He said that, point blank. It's in black and white in his word, right? If you need time to get things right, it's better not to come and 
Nobody's going to judge you. There's been times I, I don't come. That's rather awkward when you're the pastor and you're just like, I'm just not quite right. I, we'll serve it to the rest of the congregation, but I'm not going to go today. I've, I've done that before. I don't need to today, but I've done that before. Don't feel awkward. Just, just be sincere with the Lord today. The deacons will be here, and I'll be here to pray with you, too, if there's something you want to speak with us about. For those listening online, please say yes to God today. If anybody would like us to bring the Lord's Supper to you because you just can't, a little creaky from the cold weather, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll come and serve you. One of the deacons will bring it by. We'll just let it lift, lift your hand or stand. walking down the aisle and if you need to take it where you're at just raise your hands and we'll serve you. 